And so for this uh, Catholic Social do Doctrine case, what I'm going to be trying to do too is, at the end, connect it to engineering. Okay? So you start seeing sort of not only that it's a, a, an experience in learning about the culture of a country, but it actually has something to say relevant to the practice of humanitarian engineering. Okay? Um, so, uh, this is the guy that's been from the, the most popular Catholic these days, um, Pope Francis. Um, and, you know, there's pictures of him. I think there's one at the top is in Argentina um, and so forth. He, he is uh, uh, shaking things up in the Catholic Church, from what I understand. Um, there are people that like that a lot, and there are people, I'm talking about Catholics, that don't like this. Okay? Um, and so he, he is a little bit controversial, okay? Um, he has a very heavy emphasis on social justice, very heavy. Very heavy emphasis on helping the poor, okay? That is not a change in Catholic doctrine. That's just a change in emphasis by a pope, okay? The doctrine's been in place for a very long time. All, it goes all the way back to the Bible. Um, in closer to home, uh, the most famous uh, a woman in Catholic ju um, social justice is Dorothy Day, the woman on the left. Um, she started the Catholic worker house concept, is still active in the United States um, back during the, the Great Depression. The person on the right is Mother Teresa um, of Calcutta. Um, she's uh, pretty famous um, around the world. I mean, I, I don't care what religion you're in, it doesn't matter. Um, she's, she's very famous. Um, for her um, work with poor um, in India. And uh, the Indian um, like grad students I talked to or colleagues, you know, they, they admire her too. It's, 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 she sort of transcends in some sense religion. Um, it seems to me, I mean, she's, she's like way up there. I mean, people just admire her for what she does, okay? Um, so the Catholic social doctrine um, first principle and the most important principle is human dignity. So um, in the reading I did, the first statement is, is that every man and woman, in every man and woman there is the living image of God. Okay? And everything's based on that. When it, when it comes right down to it, everything else I say in lecture is just based on that statement. Okay? So what the, the implications of this are that everybody has equal dignity. It doesn't matter what you are as a person. Period. Man, woman, child. Uh, add any kind of thing on, any color, any religion, any uh, sexual orientation, any whatever, everybody, period, okay? Um, this dignity issue is, is, is complicated, I think. I, I, when I think about it, I, I think that's a pretty big demand. Um, to be able to look at your, your brother or sister and respect their dignity is easy to look at your mother or father. It's easy, right? Now, just imagine somebody else, it's a little different and stuff, and imagine that you would feel about their dignity the same as your own siblings or parents. That's what they're asking for, okay? Any religion, too, okay? So it has to be respected by everyone, and it's, they say that the only, it's only possible to safeguard and promote human dignity um, by a community and all of you. So, with respect to this class, the fundamental issue is, is you just think about people that are characterized as being poor. By which, you want to use HDI, you want to use income level, whatever it is, okay? You want to think about Chino and Rosa, you want to think about specific cases. All those people have dignity the same as the dignity of, your, of you and your parents or siblings. And so there's a sort of equality that's really fundamental that's being demanded um, here. So dignity implies rights. Equal dignity implies equal rights for all humans, period. Now, these statements are rather interesting. They don't qualify these statements. Uh, it's pretty surprising when you read it. They don't say, oh, this is only for the non-sinners, however the Catholic Church it calls a sin. Okay, they're not saying anything. that's that's irrelevant. We're talking about murders, everything. Everybody has dignity. Everybody has rights. Okay, um, so everybody has to defend these rights. And 
they say if you don't protect them, then that's a failure to even recognize the rights. Well, that, that's, uh, that's quite relevant to the issues we discussed last time with respect to gender and discrimination, right? I mean, if you're not trying to do something about it, you don't even see it. I mean, you don't even know that there's a problem. So basic human rights, the list they use, um, right to life, right to live in a united family, right to develop one's intelligence and freedom and seeking and knowing the truth, right to share in, in the work that makes wise use of Earth's material resources, right to derive from that work a means to support oneself and one's dependents, right to freely establish a family and have a, and to rear children, and the right to religious freedom. Okay. Um, now, of course, as I told you before, I'm avoiding all all controversial issues when it comes right down to it. Okay, and that's with respect to all the other religious cases and what I do in the book. I'm not going to talk about the controversial issues because they're irrelevant to humanitarian engineering, as far as I can tell. And what am I talking? Somebody name a controversial issue with religions. Abortion. Abortion. What else? Gay marriage. Gay marriage. What else? Contraception, what else? Death penalty. Death penalty, what else? Polygamy, what else? Euthanasia. Euthanasia. All this stuff. It's like, whoosh. you want to talk about this stuff? Talk between yourselves. I mean, I, I'm happy to chat about it, but you know, these are really difficult issues. They're irrelevant to us. Okay. Now, things get a little sticky here. So, the beginning of that is, is I, I grabbed this quote. Because, see, the problem is, is, is when you have all these rights, and everybody has those rights, then the question is, is when do you give up rights? That's the harder question, okay? So we're going to begin to address that. And Catholic social teaching has consistently demanded that for, the fortunate renounce some of their rights so as to place their goods more generously at the service of others. So this is, the way the Catholics are doing this is they're basically, you're going to see this time and again in today's lecture. They'll say you've got all these rights, but we're going to come to that in a little bit. Okay. okay. Now, there's a, they, they organize their social doctrine in, along the lines of seven principles. Um, first principle is known as the common good. So I'm going to just read it to you. The common good is the sum total of social conditions which allow people either as groups or individuals, to reach their fulfillment more fully and easily. That's a big um, statement. It sort of means everything. What are you doing to help everybody else out? Or are you just greedy? So this is very much opposed to a, an extreme libertarian philosophy does not fit this, period. Okay? They explicitly call that out in their doctrine. Um, everybody has to cooperate according to their possibilities to help achieve the common good. Okay, in other words, you know, to help everybody. Everybody's got to help everybody else out, is what it's saying. Um, so this requires others to seek good for others as if it were seeking that good for yourself. That's a tall order, if you ask me. That last statement, that's a big one. I mean, that's selflessness. That's an altruism. Wow, that's hard, right? Next, universal destination of goods. This, this one's a little tricky. Um, you're going to see a, a type of tension in this statement of what they mean by universal destination of goods, okay? So they say, God gave earth all, uh, to all of humanity without excluding or favoring anyone. In other words, they're saying God gives all this stuff, and that means everything you can imagine, okay? Environment, everything, okay? And God... They say, doesn't, didn't say, well, you're, you know, Kevin, you're out of this. You're not part of that. It, it, so I'm not excluded, and nobody's favored. So it's like equal, okay? So all goods are to be shared fairly by all. That is a scary statement. Why? Because that requires me to open up my wallet and give Nick all my money, right? I mean, I'm going to fear, well, maybe not that. I have to take all my money and spread it all around the room. Wow, all right? And yet, watch what they do. They'll say, they're, but everybody has property rights. Oh, that's a little different. So in the right of free trade. But property rights, they say, are subordinate to the principle of universal destination of goods. And that word subordinate is crucial. 
So what it says is, I'm allowed to have the money in my pocket, but there's a certain sort of pressure on me not to have the money in my pocket and share it. All right, and we're going to come to try to clarify that a little bit. It's very, this, this is a very confusing idea in some ways. So property rights should expedite rather than hinder the universal destination of goods. In other words, I should be like somebody like Bill Gates. and I, I, I've been given so much, and I should facilitate giving to others. That's really what they're saying. Use your private property for good, to help the common good. Next, private property allows individuals to have personal and family autonomy and there's a basic human freedom. In other words, they're putting their foot down here. You gotta remember historically how this is old stuff. This is like Karl Marx time, okay? You should be smelling market Marxism on, on what's being said here. Universal destination, good. I mean, Karl Marx said if you wanna summarize communism, it's easy. You just say there's no such thing as private property. That's what he said. Well, it's kind of what the earlier universal destination of goods said, but then the Catholics say, well, yeah, but there's private property. So it's like, huh? Okay. So the right to property, private property, they say, is subordinate to the right of common use. So the universal destination of goods is not opposed to the right of private property, but it regulates it. This is a fascinating word, I think, here, because um, yeah, I'm a control systems guy. Um, so it, it, it's it's this really characterizes what the way they're thinking. It says that uh, if I own too much, I have more and more pressure to help others. In a certain way, that's one way to interpret it. That's, that, that doesn't mean I'm I'm not able to interpret this doctrine. Trust me, but that's the way I read the statements when I think of it. And then, furthermore, uh, so the purpose of private property is to benefit others and it creates obligations for the owner. Now, the thing, what's interesting about their doctrine is, is they do not adhere to a, a statement here of just goods, just money. It's everything. It's knowledge. It's technology. It's know-how. It's skills. Wow, then conceptually, this is really, really broad. And guess what? When I talked about technological capacity and inequality of technological capacity on Monday, the Catholics would say, if you have a high amount of technological capacity, you're more and more obligated to help somebody that doesn't have technological capacity. That's really relevant to humanitarian. Okay? So, um, and they, they explicitly, I was really surprised when I read this to see them come out with this sort of statement. It's not just money, or it's not just land, it's not just the number of cows you have, or whatever. So, um, they summarized their idea and something they call a preferential option for the poor, which I, I just, I find the terminology confusing. Um, so the principle requires that the poor marginalized and those whose fulfillment is hindered be a particular concern. That is, they have primacy. In other words, the people you sort of think of that are worse off in some sense deserve the most attention. That's what it's saying, okay? And they call that the preferential option for the poor. I, I honestly don't understand this terminology. Like the option, I don't get the option word here, but whatever. Um, I think it's clear. Regardless, maybe it was lost in translation from the Latin or Italian or whatever they used. Um, so, so the way I hear this is it's it's tricky. So you have if you have more and more private, whatever it is, property, knowledge, skills, whatever it is and somebody has less and less, then you're more and more obliged to help that person. I think that's what it says to me, and that's my interpretation. So, um, and they emphasize too in this, even some more abstract things than what knowledge and skills. In fact, it's, so they, they the conflict in this document, they're, they're not big on charity. I mean, this sort of give away money kind of thing. They're big on, the social justice is big on Fix the structural problems, the political problems, the trade problems, so that you have a fair structure for everybody to have opportunities in and, and get ahead, okay? They're not, they really don't view um, just giving money away um, willy-nilly as being necessarily good. It could be good if you give your money to the right group and they use it in the right way, um, but they're, they're very careful with this, this, this charity thing. They draw a big distinction between just 
like money in fixing problems and fixing structural problems. Like, you know, they're, 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 they, their doctrine is really strongly supporting of democracy. I mean, and, and it's throughout the doc. I mean, it's, it's pretty surprising. I mean, they, they, they're being pretty bold. They're picking a political structure. I mean, think about it. Historically, they're picking a political structure and they're going with it. Okay. Um, next. Subsidiarity, I'm not going to read all those words. It goes like this. Um, you, let's say this group, of, you, it's, it's about how groups should be structured. So, if this is a group of people right here, it says that if um, that one group should not dominate another part of the same group. They shouldn't take um, their freedoms away, their, their, their initiatives away by doing things necessarily for them. It has to be the right kind of split. And this is one of their big um, complaints against um, some of the communist socialist systems um, with respect to politics. This, so there's a number of complaints along these lines with subsidiarity. It's, it, but it, abstractly, they, they have this, this uh, concept in social justice. And then in, if you want to go into this further, what they do is they apply it to political systems, civic organizations. I mean, the concept applies to any group. Okay? So later they apply it to um, groups. Participation. So participation um, means, um, you know, it's like you got a group here and um, everybody has voice. Everybody's respected. It shouldn't be that we say, oh, you women don't know what you're talking about. We're not going to listen to you. Or you people of color, you, we're not going to listen to you. So everybody has a right, fundamental right to participate in whatever it is in a group like this size, in a community, in a city, in a country politics, everything. And of course, I think you all know that a lot of people that we're, we, we're concerned with in this class for humanitarian engineering are marginalized. They do not participate, okay? And there's all kinds of gender discrimination and other kinds of discrimination. So they're saying that's all wrong. Everybody should participate as equals, period, okay? Um, Okay. Solidarity. Um, this this see, I have an, uh, an understanding of what I think of solidarity. You know, um, and then when I read this section in their their doctrine, I had a hard time understanding it. Um, so they say this statement. It's not. It's a true. They call it a moral virtue, and they say it's not just a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. So they're saying it's more than that. But to me, that's the normal definition that they say is the normal definition of solidarity. But they say, no, 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 no. It's much more than that. It's a moral virtue. Yeah, see, I guess I can get that. I don't know. I have a little hard time understanding that because I'm, I'm not focusing on spiritual sides of things and, and moral so much. And that's why it's harder to convey. Um, but solidarity is a very important notion in, in Catholicism. I don't know if you remember Lech Walesa and the Solidarity Movement in Poland. I was called the Solidarity Movement. Okay, those were a bunch of Catholics. I mean, it's an example of the use of the word. And actually, it's a pretty good use of the word, pretty active. Um, so it's, 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 they call it also a firm group. It's a determination to commit to contributing to the common good. You care about everybody. Next. So those were the seven principles, and then they apply these to all of these different areas. Family, work, economic life, political community, international community, environment, and peace. Those principles are different in each case. Participation in the family is a different issue than participation in work or participation in economic life or political life, for instance. So all, I'm not doing all of that. Um, but all of that, these principles apply to these, these examples. They're, they call them application areas. Um, I'm just going to mention um, a few, although I would really, you know, I think you should read some of this because um, it's not too long. I, I think I turned the, if it was over a 300 page book, I turned it into less than 20 um, by stripping all the, the Bible stuff out and the spirituality and the, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and only picking things that were relevant to humanitarian engineering. Um, but things like the environment, the, the perspective on environment you could read. If you're, if you're someone that's really into peace and uh, you know, the importance of peace, um, this, is a, this is a decent read. Um, 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus a little bit on work, the workplace. So what they'll have in these, these application areas, they'll have different sets of rights. Okay, so um, they make a few statements up front about work, and one of them with respect to women. So they say the long-term persistence of many forms of discrimination offensive to the dignity and vocation of women in work. Okay, um, they sort of start the whole work discussion out and, and talk about um, the mistreatment of women. Um, so they say there's an urgent need to recognize the rights of working women to aspects of pay, insurance, and social security. And they, even, they go further than that in some of the, the worker rights. So number one is a difficult issue, the right to a just wage. That is, that is actually a very complicated issue. So let's say you start, you, you go work for an international firm, they find out you're into humanitarian engineering, they say, okay, we're gonna put you in charge of the sweatshop down in Honduras, okay? You go down there and uh, you find out that your company's paying them uh, not much money at all, okay? And that's why they're down there in the first place, right? And uh, the factory is a mess, uh, they're polluting, there's unsafe working conditions, the supervisors mistreat the women, on and on and on. It's just a disaster. And this is happening all over the world, okay? But if you just focus on the wage issue, what do you pay these people? Do you, they, they took the job, freely took the job. They're not slaves. I mean, they took the job. So isn't that okay? It's capitalism. Forget it, man. They're okay. Or do you pay them like we pay them in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Probably not. So what's the middle of the road where it's really fair? And they try to make statements such as um, a living wage. They use a living wage idea such as um, saying, you know, look at the low, you know, can they support their family um, and uh, live with dignity? That's the, that's the bar they set on this. Um, but this just wage issue is, is a really a complicated one. Um, right to rest. Man, I love that one. I mean... Rest and leisure. We all have a right to rest and leisure. That's cool. Uh, they're talking about oh, on the job, you know, not, not like working somebody to the bone. You know, they got to give people a, a chance to rest. Right to working environment and, and to manufacturing processes that aren't harmful to the workers' physical health and their moral integrity. Well, certainly. And of course, you know, probably everybody in the room has a piece of clothing on that came from a nasty sweatshop in pick your country, Bangladesh. Whatever. And, you know, this is happening all the time. I mean, this is a very, very difficult issue to understand and understand the supply chain for the things that we use. That's, that's very difficult to understand. Now, I don't know where, you know, my shirt came from. I have no idea. Okay? Um, right? That one's personality in the workplace should be safeguarded without suffering any affront to one's conscious or personal dignity. Yeah, I had, I had a hard time understanding this one. To say that you're going to affront someone's personality, I think that like, my understanding of this is, is no oppression of someone in the workplace. You know, give them freedom of expression of who they are, what they are. I think that's what we're talking about here. Um, right to appropriate subsidies that are necessary for the subsistence of unemployed workers and their family. Unemployment insurance. What a concept. Yeah, right. It's gonna happen at a sweatshop? Probably not. Right to a pension, you know, retirement. Um, and insurance for old age. Sickness. What? Healthcare? Everybody has a right to healthcare? Not like our country follows that. Um, and in case of worker-related accidents, work, work person's comp compensation, right? That's what, he's, that's what they're talking about. Right to Social Security connected with maternity. Uh, right to assemble and form associations. Right to strike. This is a, these last two are a problem. Um, a lot of times in these sweatshops, um, people cannot protest um, the bad conditions or they lose their jobs um, or there's violence towards them. Um, it's really can be a tough situation. Um, okay, any questions, comments?
So um, Catholic social doctrine is, is, has a, a call to action. Now, what that means is, is, so you read all over this stuff, and then what you're supposed to do is carry it out in your life. You're supposed to live it, okay? So there's um, a lot of ways to, to live it um, that might, and everybody would do that um, differently, perhaps. It might mean that when there's a protest in downtown Columbus, you join, okay? It might mean uh, you recycle. It might mean uh, you buy a Prius. I'm not saying, I don't know what the Catholics would say about Priuses. I'm just kidding, but you get my point. I mean, with respect to many of these things, it, it, these things are supposed to play out in your personal life. You're supposed to not discriminate. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to mistreat people of, the, um, of the other genders or any ge type of gendering. Um, you know, it's supposed to be that everyone's treated equal. It's supposed to be that we treat each other with dignity in all cases. Um, and uh, so there's a, a huge number of possibilities here. For humanitarian engineering, to me, what it means is, well, let's do it. I mean, you know, you got to play out in action. Um, now, with respect to m my experience in working in Latin America, um, uh, how, is, how would I say this? The Catholics I've met, um, all, like, won't necessarily, you know, they probably haven't read the 300 page document on the social doctrine of the Catholic Church, okay? But they seem to have a, a sense of values that aligns with it. I think they're picking that up from church and stuff, apparently, or the culture, but maybe not going to church, but just like, it's in the culture. It's, it's sort of embedded. Um, so there, it's there. I mean, you can, you can feel it. It's, it's sort of there. Um, that doesn't mean that all Latinos are Catholics. They're certainly not. There's a, a sizable um, Protestant presence of Protestants, for instance, mm -hmm. various sorts, um, and non-religious. You know, that's an, you know an agnostic or an atheist. But uh, you can sort of feel this sort of thing happening in the attitudes of people and, and so forth. Um, next, I want to have a discussion point relevant to humanitarian engineering. So what does preferential option for persons poor in technological capacity mean? Can someone articulate that? We, we essentially, we got close to saying it. Uh, if there's a like technology that helps like a first world country, we shouldn't just keep that for ourselves. We should be able to share it with people that like aren't directly involved in creation, like people who buy it here, but just because they can't afford to be able to um, put into that product, they should still experience the benefits of it? Right. Um, that's along some dimensions. Anybody else want to comment? Because, look, I mean, technological capacity means not just, um, like, ownership, not just uh, then use. It means, like, abilities to create, modify. If you're creating technology, guess what you are? You're an engineer, okay? So, so it means sharing your engineering skills with the community. It means um, educating a community um, so they have engineering skills or scientific skills or mathematics skills or whatever it is. STEM, okay, education. Um, and use, and then, you know, when you, when you go, to the, go to Honduras, for instance, and you, you work on a project at Choloteca, and you, let's say you work on something, cook stove or water filtration, whatever it is, you don't just go down there and give it away. I mean, you know, you're, you shouldn't be. It should be that you're going down there and you're working with the community and you're teaching them how to use it so they can fix it. You're educating them so they become empowered and they can do it themselves the next time. Um, that's giving them not just a thing, like an object, a technology, but giving them a capability. I mean, there's this old, the old statement, you know, you don't give someone a fish, you give them a fishing pole. Well, you know, that's not bad here. It's very old cliche, but um, a fishing pole is a technology, and uh, a fish wouldn't normally be referred to as a technology. So in a certain sense, that analogy works pretty well um, for humanitarian engineering. Um, I think what this means to me, too, though, is, is, is at least if I understand the interpretation of the preferential option, uh, 
I think it means that if I have more and more technical ability, then I become more and more obligated to help someone with very low technical capability. I think that's a that's part of what they're saying, and uh, I think it's pretty important um, in a, in a sense because you know if you're only so capable, uh, you don't you don't have a certain amount of knowledge, skills, etc., STEM experience, STEM capability, you know probably okay that you don't help as much with engineering but if you've got a lot of capability it's is, is sort of they're saying that it's an obligation then um, at some point it's a very fuzzy statement though I find that, that 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 the most important piece probably for humanitarian engineering from the Catholic social doctrine is the preferential option for the poor and yet it's a very it's like more and more, more and more you have, the more and more liable you are to give to the lower, lower, worse off people. But that's kind of fuzzy because it, le and it leaves open the possibility for very wide interpretation. Because a lot, you, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but people that are wealthy will generally say, oh, I'm not very wealthy, you know, I'm only making $250,000 a year. You know, or, or they'll, people will say things like they don't. Th many people in the United States don't. They, they want to be classified as middle class, and people that aren't making much money still want to be classified as middle class. But the people upper end don't want to be classified as that group. They want to be thought of as middle class. So if you're thinking of yourself as middle class, well, I have no liability. I have no obligation. But my point, a lot of see, I was being devious last time when I told you you were all rich. Well, you are rich in technological capacity. I think you could study, somebody could probably quantify this, but in terms of your knowledge and skills and STEM, you're, you know, you're, you're in the 1% of the world. I'm sure of it. Got it. You have to be. You know? Well, that's, that's a pretty fascinating thing. And what it's supposed to do, well, if you're following the Catholic thing, if you're a Catholic or you buy into the, their idea, I should put a pressure on you. Now, nobody likes pressure put on them, right? And, and some people don't mind it. They follow these faiths and they'll, they'll, they'll live with that pressure. Other people reject it, okay? And you don't need a religion to put that pressure on you. I have, I have two really good friends who are atheists and who are humanitarian engineers and they're highly committed. No religion, God, they say I can do good without God. Personally, I buy into that completely. I, I, I do. Per, that's my personal opinion. I respect them for what they're doing. They don't, they don't need something else to, they just, it's what they do. They, they like doing it. They feel it's important. They care about fellow human beings. That's it. It's that simple. They don't, they don't need to, okay? Um, comments, questions. Um, I think we're done. I mean, if there's anybody, if, if, oh, and on these religious things, uh, if you want to talk after class, and I, I guess I got to warn you, I'm not real good, you know, I'm not an expert in a lot of this stuff, um, uh, but, or we could talk on Friday. Um, some people very much want to do that. I, I'm happy to do that, um, um, too, if you'd like. Okay, thank you. We'll see you on uh, Friday.